I'm going to talk about the personal part of grief, the personal narrative of grief. So as a millennial, which is actually none of you guys because you're past that stage, but I often find myself as the scapegoat for whatever the newsworthy problem in America is. Our dependence on technology and our resistance to doing things the way that we've always done them for the sake of tradition is blamed for everything from crime rates to economic woes to the death of mom and pop stores. I have lost count of the amount of times my generation has been bashed in a Facebook post, been the subject of a derogatory meme, or simply been told we are everything that is wrong with America. <laughs> We're entitled, lazy, incompetent, too dependent on our phones, and too out of touch with reality. Sound familiar? Now, there are many, many times that I insist that all of these things are inaccurate. But there is one truth that I have found myself unable to argue against. Our emotions and all of the physical and mental well-being that goes along with them are slaves to the internet age. We live in a constant state of anxiety, worried about what will be or what could be posted about us online. We have reduced our conversations down to Snapchatting a picture and a phrase to each other. We are unable to communicate in more than 150 characters. We no longer make poignant arguments. We just share a meme that can be read in five seconds or less. <coughs> We've even taken our videos and reduced them down to GIFs because who had time to watch the whole thing anyway, right? Now, don't get me wrong. I love a good GIF, especially the one where Bill Nye goes, science! Do it with me. Science! It's great. I <laughs> had my kids were back there doing it. So, I send short texts daily. I am constantly posting to my Facebook and Instagram accounts, but there comes a time when reducing our lives down to memes and vines actually hinders our ability to feel certain emotions. Sadness and grief become fleeting, brief moments that we can erase with the click of a mouse or the scroll of a finger. So, if you looked at my social media accounts right now, you would see the story of my life. There's prom, my 18th birthday, graduation. I married my high school sweetheart 10 years ago. We've traveled together. We have moved thousands of miles to Florida and back. We recently had a beautiful son. You can see there, baseball, wedding, vacations, Floridians living the dream. We, on all fronts, look like we have lived the most amazing, joyous, highlight real style life, the Insta-story worthy life. And by most accounts, that's true. I'm lucky to have shared so many things with the love of my life. I guess you could say that I'm incredibly hashtag blessed. Everyone take out your phones right now. I'm openly giving you permission to use your phone during chapel at least for a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> now, I want you to go to your favorite social media site, okay? Mine's Instagram, but you can go chatty snap if you want. All right, I'm going to time you for two minutes, and you can scroll and click and like and love to your heart's content. Are you ready? Let's do this. All right, now, what do you remember about what you just looked at? Any volunteers want to answer my question? Antoine, what do you remember? Huh? What do you remember about your social media account you just were on? <laughs> Something on Twitter, I don't know. All right, I would venture to guess that you all remember very little about what you just looked at, right? You scrolled quickly, mindlessly, you paid no attention to what was actually being communicated. Now, I want to take a moment to tell you parts of my life that don't make my Instagram story, the parts that hurt, the parts that are no less important in defining who I am, yet somehow these parts would be just scrolled on past without a second glance in my, if my life were just a social media feed. So I'm going to recount some events in my life that shaped um, how I view grief and um, how they have shaped me as a person and how I feel the feelings that I feel. 
1997, which is well before I think all of you were born, right? Yes, probably, except for my colleagues over here. <laughs> Princess Diana died in a car accident. I was a month shy of my 10th birthday, and you might be asking, why is that even relevant? That's disenfranchised grief. She doesn't even know that person. Well, when you're a nine-year-old girl, everyone wants to be a princess. And on that particular day in my life, fairy tales ceased to exist, and I learned that princesses didn't live forever. In 1999, <coughs> Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris gunned down 19 of their classmates at Columbine High School. I was in fifth grade, and I distinctly remember that that was the day that innocence died for me. I was no longer safe at school. I remember my fifth grade class, we went outside and we planted a columbine bush to remember those people, but that event has shaped my life forever. In 2006, I was a freshman in college, and two days shy of starting my freshman year, I learned that Comair Flight 5191 had crashed just outside of Lexington, Kentucky. And what I didn't know at the time was that a very close friend of mine, a mentor, a friend, someone I considered a big brother, happened to be on that plane. And I don't remember much about what my dad told me on the phone that day, but I do remember how I felt losing the person that showed me that we could dream and soar bigger than that small little town that we grew up in. <coughs> Fast forward to 2010. I had just moved to Florida and started a new job, and I was living the life. Everyone loves the beach, right? Well, my aunt died in a car accident that year. She was 31 years old. And I remember the heart-wrenching drive all the way back, the 12 hours from St. Petersburg to Stan, Kentucky. And at that point, I did that very bargaining thing that you do with God. Please don't let this be true. And from that point forward, I had to take on the responsibility of making sure that her daughter lived a life worthy of living and that she could go on and be a healthy adult. <coughs> In 2014, my grandmother passed away. We've all lost grandmothers, at least most of us have at this point. But she was a person who shaped my life. She was a teacher. She was a minister. She read the Bible to me. She's the one who showed me that no matter what happened to you in your life, that God was there for you. And so losing her was one of the most gut-wrenching experiences that I've had in my life. And I had the fortunate and honor to eulogize her at her funeral. And um, since I was in funeral service, I actually got to close her casket and say my final goodbyes. <coughs> and lastly, last year in 2017, and you all have, have the story in your LA 101 class to read, my husband and I, after many, many, many months, found out that we were finally expecting. But unfortunately, that pregnancy would end in a miscarriage. And so I had to grieve a person that I had never, ever met before. And that's pretty difficult. So these are the moments that don't make my highlight reel. But they are moments that are incredibly important to me. They're incredibly important to who I am. And they're incredibly important for me to fully feel that grief that I need to feel. Now I want to ask you, how many of you now feel uncomfortable, maybe a little sad? How many of you want to open your phone back up and find a funny cat video, right? Or share a meme so that you don't have to feel this uncomfortableness? It's a hard subject. I understand that, okay? The problem is, in the age of brevity, sincerity, empathy, and true feeling have taken a back seat. We are now so unaccustomed to person-to-person -person contact that real and hard things that we need to talk about are incredibly uncomfortable. And the idea of speaking to someone with emotion rather than emojis is foreign, right? How many of you are guilty of simply typing hashtag RIP or thoughts and prayers and going on about your day? Did you take the time to really think about whether the death that you have commented on or were addressing matters to you and how it matters? 
How many of you have seen a heartfelt plea from a friend and instead of reaching out, you scroll on past with the thought of too long, didn't read? So what do we do about this problem? Our first step is to acknowledge the truth, okay? The truth is that social media and the internet age has changed the way that we communicate, the way that we think, and the way that we process. Once we have acknowledged that truth, we must, must seek a way to be more active participants in our relationships with each other. We are human beings, not robots. We are brilliant minds and souls who need nourishment, and we thrive when we have a community to rely on. I implore you to put down your phones in times of stress, in times of struggle, and in times of heartache. I urge you to open your mouth rather than your web browser. Your friend or your family member has a permanent presence online probably by this point, but their time here is fleeting. Help your grieving friend. Seek help when you are grieving. You must speak, feel, grieve, love, survive, and thrive. You must disconnect in order to reconnect and never ever accept the fact that living in the internet age <coughs> means the death of person-to-person -person contact. Despite your amazing computer skills and perfect online personas, you are not a robot. Reclaim your right to be human. So, you might be asking yourself, what do I do when my friend is grieving? How can I go about helping them? It's not hashtag RIP. It's not thoughts and prayers. It's not here's this funny meme. So I have a great little short animation here that I, is near and dear to my heart. It's actually helped me a lot. What do you do when your friend is grieving? You be a person and you listen. So take some time to watch this for just a second and we'll talk just briefly at the end. So what do we do about all the pain we see in the world? All the pain we feel in our own lives? And why does it seem like our best efforts to help somebody feel better always backfire? I've been studying intense grief and loss, baby death, violent crimes, accidents, suicides, and natural disasters. And I've learned something really interesting. Cheering people up, telling them to be strong and persevere, helping them move on, it doesn't actually work. It's kind of a puzzle. It seems counterintuitive, but the way to help someone feel better is to let them be in pain. This is true for those giant losses and the ordinary everyday ones. Educator Parker Palmer writes, the human soul doesn't want to be advised or fixed or saved. It simply wants to be witnessed exactly as it is. He's talking about acknowledgement here. Acknowledgement is this really amazing multi-tool it makes things better even when they can't be made right. For example, somebody's struggling. Their baby died, or there's been a bad accident, or their mom got sick, and they're just sad. It's way more helpful to join them in their pain than it is to cheer them up. But here's what we tend to do instead. You have two other children, you need to find joy in them. Or, you know what you need? You just need to go out dancing and shake it off. Or, I felt really sad once. Did you try acupuncture? We're not really sure what to do with someone's pain, so we do what we've been taught. We look on the bright side. We try to make people feel better. We give them advice. It's not like this is nefarious. I mean, we try to cheer people up because we think that's our job. We're not supposed to let people stay sad. The problem is, you can't heal somebody's pain by trying to take it away from them. Now, acknowledgement does something different. When a giant hole opens up in someone's life, it's actually much more supportive to acknowledge that hole and let pain exist. It's actually a radical act to let things hurt. It goes against what we've been taught. In order to really support you, I have to acknowledge that things really are as bad as they feel to you. If I try to cheer you up, you end up defending yourself and your feelings. If I give you advice, you feel misunderstood instead of supported. 
And I don't get what I want either because I wanted you to feel better. It's pretty rare that you could actually talk somebody out of their pain. Rarely does the admonishment to look on the bright side actually heal things for someone. It just makes them stop telling you about their pain. It's so tempting to try to make things better. When somebody shares something painful, it's much more helpful to say, I'm sorry that's happening. Do you want to tell me about it? To be able to say, this hurts, without being talked out of it, that's what helps. Being heard helps. It seems too simple to be of use, but acknowledgement can be the best medicine we have. It makes things better, even when they can't be made right. So, my challenge to you today is to one, acknowledge that you're not a robot, that you have true feelings, and that expressing and feeling what you need to feel and working through those is incredibly important to you functioning as a human being. Acknowledge your friends, listen, be heard, and don't let the internet deprive you of what you really, truly are a human being. Thank you.